The Urim and the Thummim. Two strange words we find in the Bible only about a half a dozen times. Turn with me to Exodus 28. This is a chapter in which Moses was given instruction by God Almighty for the clothing of the high priest and the vesture of the high priest. And among other things we read in verse 30, And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. So we find these two words given as two things that would be with the high priest, and as we read the context here, it means when he goes into the most holy place. This was not given at that time for all of the rest of the priests, only for the high priest. This is verified in the scripture several times, including Leviticus 8.8, 8, which we'll not take time to read. And for those who might find a little difficulty in finding all these scripture, you might want to just write notes and go over these later, because I have quite a few bit different verses, and they're spread all the way from Exodus to the book of Revelation. I'm sorry, but in order to find out what this is, we're going to have to find quite a few different scriptures in the Bible. So turn with me to Numbers 27. And in verse 21, and this is referring to uh, the high priest, he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word shall they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And this was shown that the leaders and the people in Israel were to come to the high priest and he was to judge them by the Urim. Only the one word is used in this case. The next time it's used is in Deuteronomy 33, which will not take time to read. But turn with me over to 1 Samuel 28, because here is this strange situation that Saul found himself in after the Lord had deserted him. And then, of course, the Philistines come against them. And then in 1 Samuel 28, verse 5, and when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, now mind you, he's already in trouble with the Lord, but he inquires to see what to do. When he inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by the prophets. So Saul, the king of Israel, was one unable to get an answer from the Lord, and one of the things it said, well, he was not answered by the Urim. All right, turn to the last two times this is used in the Holy Bible, is in Ezra and Nehemiah. And they both tell the same thing, so we'll read it in Ezra 2, and we'll show that this apparently is not only a, an order that Ezra was to do, but is also a rather strange prophecy. In the second chapter of Ezra is listed the genealogies of all of the people who came back from Babylon to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city and the wall and so on. You know most of the prophecies. They listed all of them, and then we get to verse 61. And of the children of the priests, the children of Hebei, the children of Koz, the children of Barzillai, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called after their name, these sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore... They were, as polluted, put from the priesthood. Now, the, both in Ezra and Nehemiah, there is apparent admission that these people are of the priesthood. But, for some reason, some records of some genealogy was not found, therefore they were not allowed to become priests in Israel at that time. And the Tershathah, which was the governor, which would be Nehemiah, the civil ruler of the nation, said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and with Thummim. Now every place that this is used in the uh, Old Testament, these words are not translated, but they are put in there as proper nouns, as you'll notice and you'll find two or three other places. They're always capitalized, they're proper nouns, they are not translated, and so you'll have to look up in Strong's Concordance or some meaning of Hebrew words to find out what these mean and then you can begin to understand what he was talking about. The two words literally, translated into English, mean light and truth. Urim means light, and Thummim means truth or righteousness. Light and truth. 
And the governor, the civil leader in the reconstituted nation of Israel back from Babylon, had said of these certain priests, their descendants were not to enter into the priesthood, not eat of the holy things, until a priest stood up with Urim and with Thummim. Now, some of you know enough about the Mormon religion to know that part of the teaching that they have is that they have been given the Urim and the Thummim. And they claim that they therefore are the reconstituted priesthood over the house of Israel. And they uh, claim this to some extent as coming through Joseph Smith, who was the priest who stood up with the Urim and the Thummim, which they identify as coming to them through the golden plates in the Book of Mormon and so on. In case you didn't know that, I wanted to tell you so you understood there is a church in the United States, in Christian Israel, that claims that they have received this. Therefore, they are the only true prophets and priests of God. Just in case you try to tell a Mormon that we're preaching the truth and we have all this information, remember that they're taught this, that they have been given the latter-day priesthood through the Urim and the Thummim. Now, if we read verse 63 of Ezra 2 with this two words in English, it will say that these descendants of Barzillai, Barzillai were not to eat of the most holy things, in other words, not to come into the priesthood, till there stirred up a priest with truth and with light. All right, now turn to um, 1 Kings 2, verse 1. We read of David just before Solomon took over from him. Verse 1, Now the days of David grew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, And he told him, among other things, but show kindness unto the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and let them be of those that eat at thy table. In other words, he said, you take the descendants of this same priest, this Barzillai, and you be sure that you keep them at Solomon's table, because, or for so, they came to me when I fled because of Absalom thy brother. And if you'll read this story, which is told in detail in 2 Samuel 19, verses 31 through 39, you'll find that at the time that Absalom attempted to usurp the throne of David, and I'm telling you this because you must know and must realize as you watch the events of the world today that there is a people and a movement and a conspiracy and an antichrist operation today which is attempting to usurp the throne of David. But at the time when Absalom attempted to take over the throne of David, there was one priest, apparently just one priest in all of Israel, who left Absalom and came to David in the time when it looked like David was going to be dethroned, and he was a faithful priest to David. Then we find hundreds of years later that Ezra and Nehemiah have these descendants among their people back from Babylon to Jerusalem, but they say to the descendants of this one faithful priest, faithful priest to David, that they could not enter into the priesthood until something happened. A priest arose with the truth and the light. Now I'll go back to Exodus 28 before we find out who that priest was, because we must recognize that Aaron, the high priest, was given, or Moses was given for Aaron, a very detailed instruction as to what the high priest wore and carried when he went before the Lord God Almighty. And as we see this, you'll recognize that the instruction by Ezra and Nehemiah that kept Barzillai's descendants out of the priesthood at that time was not actually a degradation, but a glory that was yet to come at some time in the future. Anyway, in Exodus 28, as he's told this, verse 2, Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. Verse 4, and these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and a broidered coat, and a mitre, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. These garments were part of the necessary trappings of the priest. They were required. Moses was given this in detail, that Aaron was supposed to come before God dressed in a certain such and such a way. More of the description of the vesture was given in verse 15, And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold and of blue and of purple, purple and of scarlet and of fine twine linen, 
shalt thou make it. And then it gives the details of that. But this, before he took the ephod, in verse 9 he said, Thou shalt take two onyx stones, engrave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. With the work of an engraver of stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel, they shall make them to be set in ounces of gold. And then after this was done, and the breastplate was made, verse 17, Thou shalt set in settings of stones, even four rows of stones, the first row shall be sardius, topaz, and a carbuncle, they shall, this shall be the first row. Then he lists the other three rows, twelve stones, and then tells us in verse 21, the stone shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet or a sign. Every one with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. And thou shalt put the two wraithen chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate, and the other two ends of the two wraithen chains that shall fasten in the two ounces, and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. The ephod and the breastplate both carried the names of the tribes of Israel, and they were tied with golden chains, and Aaron was required to put that on whenever he went into the most holy place. Aaron was not allowed to enter the most holy place before God Almighty unless he carried two sets of the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. In verse 28, they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof under the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod and that breastplate to be loose from the ephod. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. In other words, Aaron had to go into the most holy place apparently with three specific things which were on his garment. And those three things were the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel and the Urim and the Thummim. In other words, Israel, light, and truth. Three things, and he could not go in without those things. Turn over to Psalm 43, and I'll just read a few parts of several verses in Psalms. Psalm 43 and verse 3, Send out thy light and thy truth. And you won't have to turn to all of these because they're very short. Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Verse 151, All thy commandments are truth. Proverbs 6 and verse 23, For thy commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. John 17:17 17, 17 says, Thy word is truth. And in 2 Peter 1 and verse 19, Peter calls prophecy a light that shineth in a dark place. So all of the scripture bears witness to us that the word of God, the law of God, the prophecy of God, the witness and the testimony of God, which we call our Bible, is light and truth. It's called that several hundred times in the scripture if you were to look all of those up. But... Who was the priest who was to carry the Urim and the Thummim before the Lord God Almighty, which he had to do before the only priest in Israel who was faithful to David, before his descendants could come back and present themselves before the Lord? Now remember, Ezra 2 and Nehemiah 7 both tell us that this priest had to arise before the descendants of Barzillai could partake of the most holy things. Let's turn to the New Testament. I don't know that I have to prove very much of this to most of you, but I want you to see that these things are being fulfilled and have been fulfilled in the people they've been fulfilled in, of course. The first chapter of John is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said in verse 9, That was the true light, and it's capitalized here, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So Jesus Christ is the light of the world even to be capitalized in the first part of John. Verse 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 8 and verse 12 tells us, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. 
In other words, by every witness of all the four Gospels and also the letters, the epistles, the book of Revelation, we are told that Jesus Christ is light and truth. Now, turn over to the book of Romans and then we'll go to Hebrews. In Romans 15 and verse 8, Paul tells us a very specific thing that Jesus Christ came for. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And I believe, of course, that one of those promises was to the descendants of Barzillai that they would be able to stand as priests before God at the time when a priest rose up in Israel with the Urim and the Thummim. Hebrews, of course, is a book which you could read from beginning to end, a letter that tells us a dozen times that Jesus Christ was the high priest of Israel. I think it's told 12 specific times with the term high priest. Hebrews 2.16 says, Of this high priest, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And I know we probably read that many times. I have heard it read, and I've read it perhaps hundreds of times, and for a long time, I thought it meant that Jesus Christ took on him the nature of human flesh. But if you'll read the next verse, you'll find that as he took on him the seed of Abraham, it was because in all things it behooved him to make light unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. His brethren who? His brethren, the priests in Israel. Jesus Christ had to be made like unto the high priest in Israel in order to become the high priest of Israel through his death and resurrection and so on. High priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Turn over to uh, Hebrews 9. And I wish I had an hour to preach this sermon because I couldn't preach it to most people, but you people are familiar with the book of Hebrews. Hebrew 9 and verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest. Jesus Christ did not come just as a citizen or a man of Israel. Christ came as the high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And remember, the high priest in Israel was required by the law given to Moses, which we read in Exodus 28, that when he went into the most holy place to shed blood, he had to go with light, with truth and with the names of the children of Israel on his garments. Jesus had to go in to the most holy place, which he did, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And then it tells the rest of this thing that he is the mediator of the new covenant and so on. Now go back to Exodus 28 again. And a good uh, lady from the church here asked me a number of questions this afternoon just before the service. And I think she'll find at least a part of this answer in here which may have caused a little confusion from the first sermon that I preached here when I implied that there's a possibility that men who proclaim they are Christians are not actually Christians in any sense of the word. Jesus Christ is the high priest. If Jesus is the high priest in Israel, he is required to fulfill everything that the high priest in Israel did, the men of the flesh. The ones who died and their sons followed, which included what we read in verse 29 and in verse 30. And Aaron. In other words, the high priest in Israel was required by God's law, and Christ was made under the law. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Jesus Christ had to accomplish that which would place Israel before the Lord continually. And you think with me as I read the next few verses of this and the New Testament, and you ask yourself the question, if anyone who preaches the Lord Jesus Christ can preach Jesus Christ 
with Urim and with Thummim, with truth and with light, if they refuse to acknowledge the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Because this high priest had the twelve tribes of the children of Israel bound to his garment by golden chains, which were required to go in with him every time. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, truth and light, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. The high priest could never, in any instance, present himself before the Lord without having truth, light, and the children of Israel as he went into the most holy place. Turn over to the book of Revelation, which is a prophecy, or these verses are a prophecy, of what we are. And I don't mean just ministers. Now, uh, I understand that in the order of events, we as ministers are given charge over people who are called sheep and we're called shepherds in the small sense of the word. But collectively, every individual who is saved by grace, who comes out of Israel or not Israel, as it were, will become what is told us here in these verses in Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 says in verse 5 and 6, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. In other words, every saved, born-again believer is actually been made by Jesus Christ a priest unto God. Amen. And this is told us in Revelation 5 and verse 10, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So it is literally true from a scriptural standpoint with the light and truth of the Bible that every one of you who claims the name of Jesus Christ is a priest before God. Now we have seen that the prophecy of a priest to arise with light and truth was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. At the same time that a certain number, apparently limited, of descendants of one priest in Israel were not to come into the priesthood until sometime after the Lord Jesus Christ became the high priest in Israel because he fulfilled the prophecies of Ezra and Nehemiah that this light and truth would come in a high priest. Now before I tell you what you should have to do, I must also point out one other thing. Turn back with me to Exodus 10. Because I agree that one of the most confusing things to Christian people is the fact that millions of their brethren in Christendom have the Bible but seem to be in darkness to the Word of God. They seem not to understand it. And here we have a strange thing happening when God brought Israel out of Egypt. And remember, the prophets tell us that our delivery in the end of the age will be after the manner of Egypt. And here in Exodus 10, during the plagues of Egypt, one of them was a plague of darkness. Verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another. Can you imagine how dark it must have been? People couldn't even see another person by them. God's darkness is very dark. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. God was able, in some miraculous way, in the same country, in the same nation, with people living right alongside of each other, some of them were living in absolute and total darkness, so deep they didn't even leave their homes, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Turn to Exodus 13, as they come out of Egypt, and we find in verse 21 of the Lord going before them with a pillar of a cloud. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. 
But in Exodus 14 and verse 19 and 20, it says, And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it, remember, the pillar of light to the Israelites was cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, in other words, to Israel, so that not one came, so that the one came not near the other all the night. The same pillar of fire, the same cloud, as it were, that gave light to Israel, gave darkness to the enemies of Israel. Do you understand that it is actually possible in this end of the age that God Almighty's Bible can give light to the children of Israel and give darkness to the enemies of Israel? Some of you have, may have wondered at the strange reaction of the enemies of Israel who can actually have the Bible and claim it and supposedly some of them even preach out of it and yet everything they preach we see is darkness. Egypt saw nothing but night and darkness in the very pillar of fire that gave light to the children of Israel. Turn over to John again, the Gospel of John. And remember, the light is both Jesus and the Word. The light is both Jesus and the Word, according to Scripture verification. John 10 and verse 24, Christ is talking to what we recognize, and he apparently recognized more than we ever did, that they were the enemies of Israel. Verse 24, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. Jesus gave them the same word he gave the children of Israel. He told them he was the Christ, testified right to them. And ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. In verse 14 of the same chapter he had said, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. In verse 3, he said, The sheep hear his voice. And in verse 4, he said, The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. In John 8 and verse 37, Christ says to the Jewish scribes and Pharisees, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. Is it possible that the prophecies to the children of Israel were that the high priest with the Urim and the Thummim was to come who was light and truth and that the children of Israel would have nothing but darkness after he came. The fundamentalist ministers tell us that light and truth in the form of Jesus Christ came to the Jews but they admit that they are still in darkness 2,000 years after Jesus Christ came. And yet there is a people, a race if you please, who can take this Bible, this light, this truth under the anointing of the Holy Spirit which is given by the Lord Jesus Christ and they can read this Bible and they get light and truth from it. And in fact we have the strange situation of ministers and priests of our race who refuse to admit the identity of the children of Israel, in other words, refuse to carry the children of Israel before God in their prayers and their preaching, they claim they're going to take just the Urim and the Thummim. But the high priest in Israel was required to carry not just the Urim and the Thummim, but Israel before God continually. In other words, I have a great suspicion, which is becoming a definite conviction in my mind, that ministers who claim to have light and truth but will refuse to carry the children of Israel before God are not the priests of the great God Almighty. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of these good gentlemen on the platform back here, if they could some way trace their genealogy, might find that they're descendants of Barzillai. I think God has raised up the descendants of Barzillai on this end of the age to carry those three things to the children of Israel, the Urim and the Thummim, the light and the truth which was tied by golden chains.
to the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And I believe that God has blessed you people with being priests in Israel who are able to see the light and the truth. And when you pray for the children of Israel, you're praying for the right people. Amen. You're praying for the ones that were taken in by Jesus Christ into the most holy place where he shed his own blood for the names of the people that he carried symbolically and deliberately and definitely on the breastplate of righteousness before God Almighty. And I think as this age draws to a close that we should be very careful about who we listen to and believe and support and whose churches we attend if they deny the names and the identity of the twelve tribes of Israel, brother, sister, I'm afraid they're like the Egyptians. The same book that gives us light is giving them darkness. And God is allowing their teachings to become darker and darker and darker as the age draws to a close. Let's praise God that Jesus Christ fulfilled the Urim and the Thummim and Israel is continually before God.